live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're going to have a conversation about racism. And I'm glad you've joined us for it, because joining me on set is a longtime civil rights activist, Shirley Jenright, right here from Fairfax County. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. Again. There's a lot going on. In fact, every day it's almost surreal what has gone on. Just when you think our president cannot possibly top himself, he manages to do so. And tonight we are looking at the fact that he will be a guest of the Commonwealth of Virginia tomorrow right. at Jamestown, yes. celebrating 400 years of our legislature, the longest operating legislature in the Western Hemisphere. That is an accomplishment. But I would say it's an accomplishment made at great expense to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans brought to this country. That is correct. It's the start of slavery in this country that has absolutely impacted everything about this country. Yes. So it must be hard for you after six decades of, of fighting the battle to eliminate racism, to put equity into our conversations, to, to feel like you must be discouraged, or maybe you're not discouraged. You tell me. <laughs> well, it's discouraging to see that uh, when I was younger in the 50s and 60s, that now today seems like I'm back in that era you know, where someone like Donald Trump can make any statement that he wants derogatory, talk down to people of color, keep kids in cages because they are children of color. And he thinks it's okay, but it's more discouraging that we have congressmen and congresswomen who think this is okay and no one has ever called him out. And I think had that been done earlier, then maybe he would not have gone as far. So once you let him out of, the, out of his cage or where he was, <laughs> yeah, box. you know, he's gone. You know, so it's, it's really hard to try to rope him back in because he figured, hey, look, I'm untouchable now because you've allowed me to do this for three years. You know, so many of us have seen the images from the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s, mm -hmm. Ruby Bridges, the integration of our public schools, and and it's hard to imagine that all these decades later, we are seeing people at Trump rallies, or we are seeing yes. neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, or we are seeing KKK mm -hmm. flyers and parades. Right. And see, when I was growing up, the KKK was very active, but they had on their hoods, you know, so you never saw the faith, or like I said, when they take the hoods off, they're your doctors and your lawyers and whoever else they want True. to be. Um, but they were active. But to see that now, where they don't feel that they need to even hide their faces, and where they're actively recruiting now and stand on the side of the roads and putting out flyers on people's cars and in neighborhoods, and in black neighborhoods, you know, that they're doing this. And I think that's a, a way of intimidation. And I think we have a different type of kids these days. You know, when I was growing up doing Martin Luther King, everything was, uh, nonviolent, and during that time we also had the Black Panthers who really were not violent. Uh, but if you had a Black Panther now, you you hear about the new Black Panthers. Right. You know, I don't think they would be as calm as the others were if the KKK went into a rally and the Black Panthers, the new Black Panthers, went into that rally. I think we will have a serious issue. You know, no, and, 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 it, and it makes me concerned, although again, sometimes it's hard to tease out the threads of what makes an impact. Guns are so much more easily obtained. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the bombing in Montgomery of the church. Yes, they killed in, Bur those little, in Birmingham. In Birmingham, they killed those little girls. And, and somebody built a bomb and had no compunction whatsoever of putting it in a church on Sunday. Right. But Dylan Roof walks into a church in Charleston, sits with these people, Kills Sits. them, yes. Leaves with his gun, goes and they arrest him with the gun sitting on the seat of the car, and they take him to Burger King. Yeah, <laughs> to and eat. they take him to Burger King. Yes. 
You know, and that's the other thing too, it's kind of like, you know, so many people of color, particularly men of color, are, are afraid of being pulled over. Like a traffic stop could mean you, you lose your life. That is correct. But we've yes. got mass shooters who sometimes are taken into custody and you're like, I don't understand. Unless they kill themselves, more often they're taken into custody. They are. Several of them have been taken into custody. And it's like, and, and people don't seem to want to acknowledge that there is a race issue exactly. in how these different people are being treated. Yes, because we have to teach our kids exactly how you interact with policemen and policewomen. You know, put your hands on the steering wheel. Take your hands and put them on top of a car. I was looking the other day on Facebook and where there's a gentleman has a, um, a little badge that he's attached to his son and said, look, put this on your steering wheel and if you're stopped by the police, just your driver's license is there, your ID is in there, just throw it on the top of the car and then put your hands outside of the window. Now that's sad that in 2019, we have to do that to make sure that we don't lose our life because we've been stopped. And profiled. Yes. You know, what, it's even crazier to me, Gian, uh, Delegate Gian Ward had put forward um, legislation, I wanna say two years ago, to add interacting with police to the driver's education curriculum here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Now you would think that this would not be controversial it wasn't race specific. It was just like, let's teach young pe people the appropriate way to act when they interact with police, like in a traffic stop. And it did end up passing, and it did end up passing into law, but there were actually people who voted against them, mm. against this bill. And it, one of them was Jim LeMunion. He voted mm. against it in committee, and he voted against it on the floor. And I'm like, why? And what does that, of course he's no longer a delegate here in Fairfax <laughs> County, but my question is why don't people question that? And they should. But if they look at what's going on around the country with again the number of black men and women, Hispanic men and women who are being stopped, who are being beaten, who are being arrested, who end up dead in their cells, you know, this is why we have to teach our kids you know, there is a certain way that you interact with the police. You know, running. Right. You know, you can't run from a police. That's a, just a natural instinct. Of course it is. If you're scared, yes, you run. Yes, you run. You know, so now we have to say, well, don't run. If you run, you get shot. If you don't run, you get, you get shot. shot. Yeah, not a lot of really good yeah. options there. Exactly, exactly. But I think people, some people don't want to know. You know, it's like, well, they didn't mean anything about, about it, you know? But, but and we talk about Eric Gardner mm -hmm. the other day. Here this man lost his life for selling cigarettes, and he was saying, I can't breathe. And then we got an attorney general who overrides the ruling. Yeah. That, that's a serious issue right there, because to me that send, sends a message to tell others, you can do this, and it's okay, because I've already set a precedence that you'll get off. You know, and it's so true even in stores, you know, kids, you, people, young people of color or adults of color who are followed around stores. Yes. I mean, and, and to me, if we don't talk about it, name it, say this is happening, you know it happens, mm -hmm. I know it happens. If, if we paid better attention, everywhere we are, we will see what's happening. It's just that I believe white Americans are not looking for it. They aren't looking for it and if they see it, they don't want to acknowledge the fact that it's existing. And that's a problem too. That's the conversations we have to have. You know, they have to know this is happening to us and this is how it impacts me or affects me. You know, my friends who are white, we need to have that discussion. You know, because they haven't walked in my shoes. They don't know what has happened to me. You know, when they can go home to their nice big house. Years ago, I couldn't buy a big house or there's certain areas that I could purchase a home in. And then I had to purchase a home that had already been purchased by a white person. So now they get the equity, so the house is now a lot more than it was if I could have purchased it 10 years ago in that neighborhood. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't understand with the GI Bill, there were many black veterans, women and men, mm -hmm. who got back and under the GI Bill should have gotten um, access to funding for a mortgage and they should have gotten access to an education, mm -hmm. except the colleges wouldn't let them in and there were neighborhoods that wouldn't let them buy a house there right. and there were mortgage companies that wouldn't finance a house in a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Right. So something, so, th so, so benefit, so, so, they, so they gave them the benefit, but they couldn't take advantage of the benefit. Exactly, exactly. And again, I, I just don't think enough Americans have been taught this because our public education doesn't teach this. Right. And see, in the public education, the books that they're using, those books weren't written by us. They didn't ask us what our opinion is. I, again, I had a conversation on Facebook, I'm on Facebook mm -hmm. all the time, and uh, one of the professors at the, um, Southern University in uh, South Carolina was stake, st stating the fact that she had read a book and how much she had learned out of that book. She said, and I wasn't taught this in school. Well, she and her, doc her husband are uh, PhDs. So I said, well, this is an opportunity uh, for you and your husband to start writing because if we are not a part of writing the story, we are either left out of the story or it's interpreted the way the writer wants us to know it. That's absolutely true. You know, uh, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, I mean, he's done so much for the Innocence Project, pointing out yes. how often uh, people are, of color are not only unjustly incarcerated, but executed. Exactly. It's a major problem. Right. And so he has shown a light on something that, you know, until, until his activism really became well known, people really did not acknowledge that that's what's happening, that mm -hmm. the mass incarceration issue is just a follow-on to Jim Crow, and Jim mm -hmm. Crow was just a follow-on to how to deal with, with emancipated black people. Right, right. Right, so people were not taught that. So you, you get this sense of the terribleness of some of the things that's hap that have happened in the black community, but then you look at hidden figures, yeah. and you're like, why did it take 50 years 50 years mm -hmm. to tell the story of those women. Smart women, accomplished women, educated women, right. doing big things. And, and so neither side of the story of the black experience mm -hmm. is being told. Right. How terrible it is or how extraordinary African Americans have been in, in bringing amazing things to our culture. And so I hear the music, Shirley, so I'm going to invite everyone to come back after the break. We are talking with Shirley Jen Wright, who is with us here in Fairfax County and is a longtime civil rights activist. Join us after the break. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. responsibility oh it's huge I know it's huge and the salary oh my god yes right? I mean like I was literally I was about to move in with my parents and <laughs> right before the, yeah so this saved me I, I really believe in you you know thank you it's nice to hear that from someone <laughs> these are cool did you um what did you
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and you're joining us tonight in a conversation on racism. Joining me is Shirley Ginwright. She is a longtime civil rights activist and a leader in the community. And I want to talk a little bit in this segment, Shirley, about the disparities in treatment around drug issues. Well, I think that started during the crack cocaine. Yeah, in the 90s. Yes. With the, in the black community, we had the, the, the rock. Yep. And in the white community, we had the powders. Right. You know, so it, it, one of the uh, things that were said, that the blacks were arrested because they didn't have the penthouse or the country club to do their drugs, so they did the drugs around in the alleys mm -hmm. or at the house, so they got arrested for that. But then it was an addiction. It was a serious problem. And the result of that was, and the consequences, were they were incarcerated and jailed. But then, again, it was mostly the minorities. Absolutely. That were being incarcerated. Now, if we move forward some, we have the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. the drug crisis from painkillers or whatever they may have taken. And those mostly impacted or affected are the whites. And it's a health issue now. It was a health issue in the 90s. It was. You know, so how can it, well, we know how it can be a, a health issue now because it's not the black kids that are dying because of the opioid crisis because a lot of the black so who need the painkillers can't afford it because of the uh, medical, right. not having uh, medical insurance. You know, so here they are still in pain. So we can treat one and we say, oh, well, we're going to do that and we're going to give them, if they overdose, we're going to give them the Narcan. And, right. And then they turn around and do it again. They're treating <laughs> it. They're treating it like a public health crisis, which it is. Yeah. But the it point is. is, is that the opioid addiction crisis is not different from the cocaine crisis of the it 90s. It is not. It is not. How people were treated based on whether it was crack or whether it was powder, is about race. Mm -hmm. it, it is. It is totally a story about yeah, race. Because and a lot of the laws that really cracked, you know, the three strike laws. A lot of the strike law, three strike laws that have imprisoned people for just decades yes. over drug charges came about in the 90s. That's exactly right. And yes. now we're going, don't put them in jail. Treat them. It's an addiction. It's a disease. Well, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But we've still got our prisons filled with people who are there on drug charges. And not right. just hard drugs either. And not even trying to let them out. And see, one of the things that bother me the most is that even those who are running for office now, president, they aren't talking about how we get these people out of prison. Right. You know, we're addressing, again, the opioid crisis as, as an illness. But we still have the same people who've been in jail for, in prison for years. Now, 30 years, And no years. one is talking about the difference. Exactly. And no one is talking about, oh, I'm going to put a bill in, you know, to make this happen. It's sort of like, okay, it's blown over. And, and sometimes it's not even serious drugs either. Marijuana has presented this yes. perplexing dilemma in that, you know, in Virginia, we had an uptick. Mm -hmm. I read something that said we had an uptick in marijuana uh, arrests and the governor would like to decriminalize marijuana. Right. But which is not the same thing as legalizing marijuana. That is correct. Decriminalizing means you don't go to jail for possessions oh. of small amounts. Correct. It doesn't mean that you're free to smoke it in um, the public square. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have a caller. I'm, yeah, we, do we have a caller, from, uh, George, from Centerville? Are you on the line, George? Yes, hi, good evening. Good evening, how are you? I'm excellent, thank you. And what is your question? I have a question for Ms. Ginwright. Sure. I'd like, I'd like to know what her thoughts are on Confederate names for schools in Fairfax County and what we should do about them, if anything. I think Confederate names should be changed, not just at Fairfax County Schools, but anywhere that we have Confederate names on buildings, the federal buildings, government buildings. I think it needs to be changed. Uh, when I was president of the Fairfax County NAACP, uh, I led the charge uh, with other advocates to uh, change the name of Jeff Stewart High School. 
So I still think those uh, school names should be changed because people don't understand the history behind those names and the pain that comes with them for those kids who are now attending these schools and where most of these schools are uh, children um, of minority kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, <laughs> and they're having these names um, that they can't explain, that uh -huh. they just don't have a history of it. You know, I think it's, it's also an opportunity to talk about when these schools were given these names, too, because in the instance of Jeb Stewart, I believe it was 1954, 56, right. which was after school integration. Mm -hmm. So it's not that Jeb High School was given that name in 1865. It was given that name to make a statement mm -hmm. about integrating the Integrated county's school. public yes. schools. Right. Somebody was saying to me that there's a Robert E. Lee High School in Stanton, Virginia, mm -hmm. and it used to be Stanton High School until massive resistance, and it became Robert E. Lee High School. And mm -hmm. now there's a movement in Stanton to it's rename it Stanton name. High School, which is right. what it was before we had this terrible, terrible situation in Virginia mm -hmm. of massive resistance. But again, if you were not taught anything about massive resistance, about the governor of Virginia, who swore he'd shut them all down right. before he would integrate them, mm -hmm. then you don't understand where these Confederate names came from. Mm -hmm. right. it, it was, it was, you were talking earlier about things people do to intimidate other people. Well, it's not, it's, the name is not so much historic as it is a tool of intimidation. Right, and now with all of the hatred that we're seeing from the White House and with these Confederate names, this just helps to fuel I'll put fuel on the flame, as they would say. And the other thing, you know, I keep talking, so we're celebrating the 400th year anniversary of Jamestown and the legislature, 1619, our legislature. The Civil War is four years. Mm -hmm. Out of over 400 years of history, four years. Mm -hmm. It's four years where we left the Union, committed treason, and lost a war. Right. I mean, just to put it in a nutshell. And, and, and you put still a bow have on some it. people who, who, will argue that they, there was no treason, treason committed. Well, if you lose the <laughs> union, there is. Because we, in the Constitution's kind of a compact. We all agreed that we were going to be under the rule of law, and exactly. the rule of law is governed by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But people need to understand where this is coming from, too, and the fact that we have had a lot of history since 1865. Right. A lot of history. We were talking about the women of, of hidden figures. We were talking about Katherine Johnson. You know, mm -hmm. why in the world can't we name high schools for a variety of people who have added to the culture of this country mm -hmm. in significant ways? So I would posit perhaps we are asking the wrong question mm -hmm. about renaming but high schools. It was schools. just like uh, Barbara Johns was one of the names that was submitted uh, to rename Jeb Stewart High School, and we ended up with Justice High School because Barbara Johns and uh, Colonel Gonzalez and uh, Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, yes. You know, so to uh, and I look at it as a compromise. It's I okay, do too. We just call it as justice. And the thing but is, we don't have a school in Fairfax named after a woman. Period. And here you have Barbara Johns, a young woman that walked out of a class. Right. You know, to advocating, protest. Yes. Advocating as a student yes. for better schools yes. and better instruction. I agree with you. You know, we haven't even touched on, you know, that the bottom of the list are women of color mm -hmm. and the contributions of women of color that are consistently not elevated and are in fact overlooked. Yes. Right? Yeah. So why isn't somebody out in the street saying, why aren't we naming and renaming high schools out, for, for people after 1865 who made enormous contributions mm -hmm. to our country or our county or our communities? Right, and there's a lot of them out there. There you are. Know, I mean, there's a lot of overlooked yes. people. But, you know, and, and again, the fact that we have embraced this Confederate history, we haven't questioned the Confederate history, we allow schools to go on with the names of these people on their buildings, I mean, what message does that yeah. send to the children sitting in those classrooms? Mm -hmm. Because even under the massive resistance, there was, I think it was Prince George's County, where the schools were shut down for like oh, Prince five, Edward, Prince Edward, Prince County. Edward County. The and schools were shut down for five years, right? And they took uh, government taxes to pay to send the white kids to, to school. a private academy. Yes, um, Kirsten Green has written a book, "Something Must Be Done" about Prince Edward County, mm -hmm. and she is local. She lives in Richmond. Her 
beloved grandfather who was a dentist is one of the people who helped to shut down the schools and build that white academy. Mm -hmm. And those children were denied a public school education. They were. Most of them were black, but it also included poor white children, too, mm -hmm. who could not afford the academy that was being subsidized. But well, see, when with I was growing dollars. up, when you saw a poor a white kid, they, they would say they were black. Because <laughs> they just throw, throw everybody in the same. Right. But, but again, does anybody know or understand the history of things like that? And the mm -hmm. irony of Prince Edward County's schools having been shut down for five years is that that's where Barbara Johns came from. Yeah. Moton High School is the high school she walked out of advocating, mm -hmm. but that, and she was one of the um, plaintiffs in Brown versus Board of right. Education too. Mm -hmm. But is anybody taught any of this in school? No, no. And I think that this is, you know. And I think we need to start putting that history in our schools. We need to look at the books that we have now and say, hey, look, these are no good. We have to start over. We have to do something about this. Absolutely. The and textbooks are, are, are written not necessarily by historians at all. They're written by textbook writers. Yes. And so I don't know, you know, if any And how much research have they done? I know. <laughs> Fact-checking. But again, there's the crime of omission. To me, it's the crime of omission. Mm -hmm. It's not just what you're teaching. Sure, te you know, make children memorize all of the battles of the Civil War in Virginia. But what did you omit? What history are you not teaching? What, what didn't get taught so that you could teach that? Mm-hmm. You know, how about the accomplishments of women? You know, the only woman's portrait that hangs in, in our capital enrichment is Pocahontas. <laughs> you know, um, a 12-year-old Native American girl who is, you know, lauded for saving one man, John Smith, and marrying another white man, John Rolfe. Mm -hmm. and, and she's the only person, the only woman in American history that we remember as having contributed something to the Commonwealth of Virginia. You know, we need to be asking more questions about why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. And even if they aren't going to put it in the schools, you know, maybe we can have discussions around the county in Fairfax, you know, on a weekend or something, just have these open discussions and have some of the historians come in and talk about the history. And probably going to be very controversial, some of it. But at least it'll be a learning. And, and, and some of those individuals who've actually lived through it talk about their experience. And I think experience is very important. When we come back from our break, we will be talking with Shirley Jinwright, who is a civil rights activist. I want to talk about Equity in the Center as well, a wonderful organization that is doing a lot of work in the social nonprofit sector about educating us all about racial bias. So join us after the break. Gotcha. <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites. And booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh. But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting. Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to teen-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the- Mom, you don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. 
You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and you have joined a conversation about racism tonight. And joining me is Shirley Jenright, who is a longtime civil rights advocate who is now here in Fairfax County. Thank you so much for being here, Shirley. So Equity in the Center um, is an organization that's doing racial equity work, helping people to understand their biases, specifically in the social and philanthropic sector. And I went to a two-day conference in May that was eye-opening with, with a room full of people of every description and every background. And it was, it was an amazing journey and it was wonderful to take that with other people. Uh, a good friend of mine, Amanda Ondere, had said to me that if you want to do racial work, if I want to work on myself, mm -hmm. that Equity in the Center, and equityinthecenter.org is where other people can find that information. But it, it was eye-opening for me. And one of the things about trying to be a good ally in this is to understand that, you know, we cannot gallop in and do things for the black community. Mm -hmm. There's a savior complex of all us yes. well-intentioned do-gooders who are like, I'm here to help you, yes. right? Yes. But, but it's about nothing about us without us. And that to me is sort of something that I have in my head is that we need to understand as allies, as white people, in trying to help break down biases and move this whole, this whole movement forward to create equity we have got to be better allies. Mm -hmm. So speak a little bit about, because you, I'm sure, have been around white people all your life. <laughs> well intentioned. <Just about. laughs> well, in, well intentioned white people, right? And, and, and there is something to be said. I mean, I want to help, mm -hmm. but there are more, there are less effective ways and more effective ways for people to be helpful. Yeah, and I think sometimes, um, and I, I, I can appreciate them wanting to help. Uh, maybe you should ask exactly how can I help, you know, as opposed to just jumping in. Uh, I had a long discussion once with, uh, with a friend of mine, I consider a friend, and she had just gotten in the middle of a conversation that I thought she had no clue of what she was saying, but she was trying to help. And the more she said to me, the worse it got for her, right. <laughs> you know, she so. She was digging a hole deeper and deeper, but she thought she was helping, you know, so to the point that I had to just go offline and just say, hey, look, back out for and a so, and, and so no. I, think, I think people yeah, in this not. climate, too, oh. are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yes. Doing the wrong yeah. thing. But that's why I say if, if, if you don't know, just ask, how can I help? What can I do? And sometimes people don't ask that question. They don't. And, and then they just think that they're helping us because they think that's what I need to do and this is the best way to do it, but it may not be what I need. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and the other thing too is all of your black friends should not also be educating you all the time. And this is one of the things that Amanda pointed out to me is that it's not necessarily black people's job to educate everybody. Yep. There are places like this conference where I can go mm -hmm. and I can invest my time to figure out what I need to know um, about how to be a good a good support person. Right. You know, and, and again, I am trying to be a much better ally. And, and I think it, for the purposes of this show tonight, giving suggestions to people about where they can find, there are right. books to read, mm -hmm. right? There are books to read, there are conferences to go to. You know, we actually in Fairfax County have a chief equity officer now, Paula right. Bruce. Yes. And you know, and there are there are so many initiatives being put forward and so possibly people need to raise their hand or ask that a professional person come into their group. Yeah. And and again, uh, when they come into that group uh, or they hear about a program that's going on, you know, they should attend. But what I would like to see not just a a program like the one you mentioned and you go in, and everybody in there white. I know, uh, that's yeah. not helpful. <laughs> it like, is not. Like Equity in the Center, I was in a room of Native Americans and African Americans and, and Hispanic see, and all those, kinds of people in that yes, room. Yes, and those to me are the most effective. 
Right. Because you can then you can have those discussions because you have all of the different ethnic groups. You know, I don't want anyone to just focus on me because I'm black. I have friends that are Native Americans. I have friends who are Hispanic. I have friends who are Asian. You know, but they have some of the same problems and issues that I have, you know. So it's important that we not just reach out to one group and say, oh, well, you know, they're having a rough time now, so I'm gonna just work on this group. Reach out to all of the minority groups and find out what's going on. And that's why I mentioned the communities of trust. This is one thing why we wanted to do in that and why we have such a diverse group. You know, because we can bring those issues and discussions to the table about what's going on in the community. And we are, we're planning now um, a forum on hate crimes and hate biases uh, with the police department and the uh, FBI. I want to you know, talk more with you about communities of trust. We have a caller on the line, Joanne from Alexandria. Joanne, are you there? Yes, I'm here. And what would you like to ask? I want to know if you were talking about the injustice in the court system because um, I've been living in Virginia for 2004, since 2004, and have never been called to jury duty. And then I was working with a bus station and all my um, co-workers there never been called to jury duty. And they've been born and they were born in, in, in um, Virginia. So I wanted to know why is it that black Americans are not being called for jury duty in Fairfax County, Virginia. Mm. And I did have a court one time, and it was one teacher, black teacher, but she was dismissed. And everybody else in that jury was not my, of my peers. And they say that they're supposed to be of your peers, and I thought your nationality. But they telling me, no, it's just your age or something. But I, I wanted to make sure that if y'all wasn't talking about that, the court system is so biased and prejudiced that they don't even have black people or the ones that I'm around come to jury duty. Well, thank you for that, Joanne. And you make a really excellent point. Um, are you registered to vote? Yes, I am. Well, see, now that really raises a red flag for yes. me. Because it seems to me, and I do not know the ins and outs of jury duty, but I know one of the, the uh, sources that they use are registered voters, mm -hmm. I believe. And, and Joanne, I can, uh, I can attest to that because I have never been on jury duty. And I've been here since 1976. Wow. And I have never served on jury duty. Wow. Thank you for that call, Joanne. And so this really brings up something when we talk about representation mm -hmm. and the fact that the people in the court system are not represented in juries how about the kids sitting in classrooms who aren't represented by their teachers that is true and that's a huge problem even in Fairfax County where we do not have enough minority teachers we don't have enough minority principals or superintendents so when the kid a minority child wants to relate to someone that looks like them, they don't have anywhere to go. So I think they would hold back their feelings because they don't know how to talk to this person. And, and our is. teachers, some of them haven't had sensitivity training, so they don't know how to relate to the child because they know nothing about that culture. Yeah, and that's, it, it's cultural competency training. Yes. And so, you know, I, the Brookings Institution came out with a study recently that that we've all known that teachers are a um, majority women, mm -hmm. but it is more a majority of women right now in our history than it ever has been previously, mm -hmm. ever has been. Over 80% are women. Even men who, who used to be in the teaching field are getting out. And in addition to being majority women, it's majority white women, right. young white women. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it's inner city Chicago or it's Fairfax or it's right. Arizona, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Y young white women are staying in about five years and cycling out. Right. And then you and, get another group. Right. And then if you f look at the uh, stats, even in Fairfax County, it shows that the applicants, the black applicants who were not hired by Fairfax County had a higher education 
than the white applicants. Yeah, I remember seeing something yeah. about that. And the yeah. fact that, that they didn't realize it because each school was doing its own interviews. I remember this yes. article. Each school yeah. was doing its own interviews, and so minority candidates weren't being hired. But when they put all that data together, it's kind of like, wow, lots of applicants, and they're not being hired. Right. So it doesn't necessarily look like it was some concerted effort. Mm -hmm. And this goes back, in my thinking, to implicit bias. Mm -hmm. You know, the, th the things people have in their heads are what, about what they believe about minority candidates. That's exactly right. And I think, I, I know uh, from what I'm told, the principal is, has the final say for who's hired in the school. And I think that's probably part of the problem. Why not have it? human resources right. to the hiring. That's why you have our human resources. And maybe we can eliminate some of this bias. Because if I was, I mean, yeah, when you're walking on class, when you're walking on school, and I, I substitute here in Fairfax County, and there's one school that I know, I've, I've, the only time I've seen a black was in the office and in the cafeteria. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, I know you got some black teachers. And then I went to another school that was a Title I school and saw lots of black teachers. Yeah. You know, so I'm thinking that you'd segregate them all in one place. And, you know, and we have to talk about that, too, because, you know, when Kamala Harris said something in that debate about busing, mm -hmm. suddenly a, I think a generation of people, especially young people, who don't really know the history of busing or why we, why we relied on busing to help integrate the schools mm -hmm. and suddenly busing has come back up again and people self-segregate right. people self-segregate in their churches in their neighborhoods sometimes it's a matter of what you can afford mm -hmm. in groups of people again when you have denied an entire group of people inherited wealth and people want to talk about cycles of poverty it's like mm -hmm. well why do you think we have cycles of poverty could mm -hmm. it be that you know African Americans have been denied any access to right. wealth building that is exactly. inheritable. Exactly. I think that could be it. You know? So people do not understand how uh, communities end up clustered together mm -hmm. and because boundaries tend to be drawn based on geography, right. that we are ending up with de facto segregation because of where people are living. Right, and then now to try to overcome that, they say, oh, we're gonna bust your child across town you know, to attend right. this school. Well, that might not be convenient for the parent right. who has no transportation if they, in case something happens to that child. Right. You know. Yeah. I, I know. These are all the issues when we, you know, we, we've got one segment left. And it, there's so much to talk about that people haven't thought about. And I guess that's my point is that if we don't go out and proactively seek this information and educate ourselves right. and educate our children and educate our neighbors, we're never going to understand why we arrived at this place. Right. So please, join us after this break. Nice going, Spencer! I can't believe we broke old man Hennessy's window. Correction, dude. You broke. I just threw the ball. This is really bad. What are we gonna do? We? we? Go to the door and ask for the ball back. Are you serious? It's my ball, Myrtlebeck. You're so dead. I'd run away. Yeah, to Uruguay. Kiss your life goodbye. Sorry. Let's go. Some friends you are. Oh, keep smiling, Hi. Hi. Tell him it was an accident. And we can fix the window. Come on. I'll come with you. Loyalty. Pass it on. You go first. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One of some and that's no good. Yeah. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about three thousand. Ah. Nothing very nice. I'm a homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you. Can prevent wildfires. Fire. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. 
You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're having a conversation about racism with my guest, Shirley Ginwright, who is here in Fairfax County and a longtime civil rights leader. Thank you so much for giving your time this evening. This has been invaluable, Shirley. Yes, thank you. I think one important piece we want to cover before we wrap up our show in this segment is about the importance of elections. Joanne called in. Yes. I asked, are you registered to vote? And she said, yes, she is. You said you're registered to vote, but a lot of times people will not vote in every election because in Virginia, we have elections every, every year. year. Yes. So talk to every us a little year. bit about the commitment people have to make to vote every time. Well, first of all, they need to understand that people gave their lives so we will be able to vote. You know, and to me, it's a slap in the face if they don't use that privilege. It is, to, a, to, is to a privilege. Cast, it is a right cast, and a privilege yeah, and a responsibility. It, right. Um, I think another thing that a lot of people don't understand is that in our local elections, it's the local politicians that make the laws that you follow every day. You know, right. It's not the governor. It is a, the president of the United States. So they figure, okay, I'm going to vote in the presidential election because this is a huge one. Well, the president makes executive orders and laws, or the Congress and Senate make the laws, for the entire country. But they need to vote in their communities to make sure that their voice is heard. If they have a politician that is not doing what they thought he was supposed, he or she was supposed to have done, they went a different direction, then the next election, vote them out. But you cannot have a voice if you do not vote. You're and that's what I try to tell everybody. You know, I, at one time, and this, was, of course, was doing uh, when President Obama ran the first time, and I was knocking on doors because we had a list of people who hadn't voted. And I walked, knocked on this one young lady's door, three flights of stairs in the apartment. She said she didn't vote because she didn't have a babysitter. She had three little kids. I said, okay, I'll babysit. You go vote. There and that's go. what I did. You know, but we can find all kinds of excuses not to do that. But I don't think they really understand. It's the local. I would rather see them vote more at the local elections because these are the laws so that you have to. So let's go back to George's question about renaming of the schools. Yes. So who renames the schools? Well, the school board votes the on board. it. school board, yes. So if you. We advocate, the school board makes, makes the changes. Right, and so I, if you can't name, so if everybody playing at home can't name who's on their school board, this is a red flag. Exactly. The fact that we're losing five members of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors will all be replaced. Right. Open seats. But if you don't know who those five people are who are rolling off, you're kind of behind because we've got 99 days. Right. 99 yes. days to elect a new school board, right. a new board of supervisors, Sheriffs are up for election. Mm -hmm. Treasurers are up for election. Soil and water is up for election. Right. Our Commonwealth's attorneys, up for election. hugely important. When you talk yes. about the criminal justice system, as Joanne was talking about, yes, the Commonwealth's attorney is the state's prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Whether a case is tried, isn't tried, what it's charges? Up to Commonwealth attorney. Yes. It is. Yes. And so, if if people in the community mm -hmm. don't know who those people who those people are, what they stand for, mm -hmm. and don't go out and vote then you're having things done unto you. Right, exactly. And in a democracy, and, it's not set up that right. way. And they're going to have some more forums, from what I understand. You know, they can go listen to some of those forums or go to the, the uh, candidate's website, Yeah. you know, and see what they stand for. You know, now they're getting ready to open their offices. Go to the office and find out what they stand for. But don't just sit home and not vote and say, my vote doesn't count. Just think if we have a thousand people say, who's sitting home because my vote doesn't count. Well, and so get mad, because I, I find that I'm very motivated by anger. And so get mad about the fact that Virginia has elections every year. And yes. that was done to us by Harry Byrd. Mm -hmm. Harry Byrd Sr., who wanted, we are the last state in the United States with a one-term governor. We are one of only two states with off-year elections. New Jersey's is the other one, mm -hmm. which puts us in a four-year cycle. 
And we are now in the fourth year of that fourth year cycle, and we call it an off, off, off year election. No governor, no senator, mm -hmm. no congressman. There, there's no marquee race, no presidential. We're mm -hmm. not, we don't have elections. We, we don't elect these people during a presidential race. Harry Byrd did that to us on purpose. Mm -hmm. This was legislation of white supremacy. So if being angry motivates you, then be angry that you have to vote every year and exactly. then go out and vote every year. Exactly. And then the other thing that I'm looking at, uh, I still think we need to recycle some of our elderly, even in age, uh, politicians because some of their mindsets haven't changed. You know, they, they just sit back there and I've gone to, I've gone down to General Assembly and I've seen some of them actually sit there and sleep. I tell you, it's, uh, uh, it's frightening. It's frightening. The mindset is in fact frightening. Yeah. It really is. You know, so that's how we have, we have a lot of young candidates oh, running this time. We have a lot of minority candidates running this time. You know, I don't want somebody to go vote just because you have a young person or a minority person, but who do you think is going to best represent you and what you stand for and what you want to happen? And our criminal justice reform is huge to me because we're getting too many and have always had too many of our kids going into the criminal justice system. Yeah. And especially with the marijuana, you know, for small amounts. Low level charges. Very low level charges. And even if they get thrown out, if they go to court, these kids are required to get an attorney and for bail. money that they don't have. Cash bail. Cash bail yes, is a terrible system. Yes. We have a, a one-year reprieve about the suspended li driver's license, in case people watching right. are not aware. 400,000 Virginians had their license suspended for unpaid court fines and fees. Yes. And those court charges may have had nothing to do with their driving, mm -hmm. but it was just a punitive action that, that targets poor people. Right. And so it, they've, for, the, for the year they have suspended it, but it's not a budget line item, mm -hmm. which means that when this year is over, unless they um, pass a bill or codify it in the budget somehow, then we have the system where it's going to go back that if you can't pay your fine because you don't have the money and you're poor, they'll just take your driver's license away, okay. which means you yeah. can't go to work. Mm -hmm. You can't pick up your kids. Or, or you go to, to work or, and you're driving without license and then you get caught again. And then you more get incarceration yes. and bail money. And I mean, it's just a horrible system right. that targets the poor. Right. So in other words, if you want these things changed, you have to vote. You, you have, have to have get to out. Vote. You have to get out and vote. And, and you have to vote every time, too. Yes, Every definitely. time. You know, we had primaries in June, and the voter turnout was so low. I and know. in some districts where there's not two candidates running, mm -hmm. people didn't realize that when they didn't vote in the primary, that basically the person who won either the Democratic primary or the Republican Party just elected their representative. Yes. Because it's an uncontested race. Yes, exactly. You know, I don't think we're doing a good job with civics. I don't think people, adults of voting age, really understand how this works. Mm -hmm. One more important thing too, you can vote absentee in person. Right. Yes. And if you're a college student, you can if you can decide whether you want to vote where you go to school. So if you're at Virginia Tech or some of those more rural places, you might want to decide where you want to vote, but you can vote where you're going to college or you can vo mm -hmm. vote absentee where you live. Mm -hmm. So, so ch people with children or a long commute where you think you're not going to get back in time to mm -hmm. vote, there's a list of right. excuses and, and that you can we use. We even have it here for uh, voter registration. The League of Women Voters can go into the high schools and register kids. Yes. You know, so, and I think we're going to have, uh, hopefully, a big upsurge of these 18-year-olds coming out to vote. I think know, because so. Because it's a, their first time. I think it's their first time, and I think young people are focused on climate change. Yes. And gun violence prevention. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are kids who have spent too many hours locked in closets in their classrooms mm -hmm. for active shooter drills. Mm -hmm. I mean, where are the something. adults? Where are the adults in this world that we have not adequately protected our children mm -hmm. from the trauma of lockdown active shooter drills? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope to see 18 years old, 18 year olds at the poll going, you've done a terrible job and I want to elect somebody who's going to do a better job. And also to your point about diversity, it's not about identity politics. Mm -hmm. It's about, guess what? There are lots of women of color and Hispanic women and LGBT people who are smart, committed, dedicated, exactly right. 
and they and they want to run for office. Right. It's that people want to run for office because they have something to offer. Exactly. Oh, and and they come from a different lived experience than a lot of people currently sitting in those seats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the voices we need. Absolutely. We need all of the voices around the table because then we can support everybody, not just one particular group. And I've seen that too often in our politics, you know, with the bills being killed before they even get. Right. They don't even get yep. to the floor, you know. Well, we're not going to even address this. Yeah. Well, to me, those are the individuals that we need to vote out. ERA. Because you don't give an, e yes. The ERA, yes. killed in a committee. We need, we need two, we need to flip two seats. <laughs> we, need to, <laughs> to well, we need to hang on to the seats we have. Yeah, we'll hang on to the seats. flip two seats. But true, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, we could have been the 38th and final state. If it had gotten a floor vote, it would have passed. Right. But a party that has a majority of one seat in each house packed a committee that killed it so it couldn't go to a floor vote. And people need to get mad about right. that. If, exactly. if anger motivates you, you think about these things. Mm -hmm. For the next 99 days, think about how wrong so much exactly. of this is. And then go down when, when, when they're going to be discussing these bills. Go down and testify and mm -hmm. support them, like the decriminalization of marijuana. I get, uh, Senator Evans, like, bless his heart, you know, he's been fighting this for a long time. Yes. You know, yes. And every year I go down and speak on behalf of the decriminalization of marijuana. You know, when, when I first started, it was like $170 million a year that we were spending on marijuana arrests. Just think what we could do with $170 million to go toward the school system. I was about to say, maybe we could give teachers enough of a raise exactly. that, that minority children would want to go into the profession. Yes. Because I think the main reason that families don't encourage their children to be teachers is because they don't believe they can make a living at it, which is a sad commentary mm -hmm. on a country that says it values education. Exactly. But we aren't showing it. We aren't showing it. And I just want to leave everyone with this thought, too, is that um, President Trump will be in Jamestown tomorrow. Yes. Um, I don't know whether the Democrats will or will not be attending the ceremony. There are some of the uh, Virginia uh, Black Caucus have said that they will not uh, attend that section of it. Of it. Yeah, and so section. I just want to say, with all due respect, that you know, without the Democrats there, it kind of looks like it did 400 years ago with a couple more skirts and no powdered wigs. Mm -hmm. And Virginia should make note of that as well. Yes. Right? Yeah. The Democrats have brought the d diversity, the representation, and a lot of the things that are bringing us to the progressive policies that yes. we want. Yes. So thank you so much, Shirley, for thank being here. Thank you for having me. It's my you, pleasure. You have been awesome. I love your work with the uh, Communities of Trust. Continue, go out there, go forward. Celebrated five years. I know. Well, congratulations, fifth anniversary. And thank you so much. Keep doing the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much.